The new coronavirus has already killed hundreds of thousands of people across the world, and it's upped our lives, changing the way we work and who we can meet. Problem is, we can't see it. SARS-CoV-2 is an invisible, deadly threat that could be lurking anywhere. But not everyone believes that. It's pure panic now. I don't know anyone who's sick. In March, I knew sick people, ski holiday makers and others. We're here because we believe only scientists following the guidelines of the government are being listened to. Clearly, many only believe in what they can see. Where does that leave us when an enemy is invisible? Welcome to your COVID-19 special here on DW News. I'm Monica Jones in Berlin. Good to have you with us. Now, for months, you have seen representations of the coronavirus, like this one behind me. But does the virus really look like this? And does it matter? Yes, it does, because the better we know the virus, the better we can fight it. And luckily, there are people who can make the invisible visible. Brothers Ben and Fionn had planned to be with their grandparents in England right now. The coronavirus pandemic made that impossible. So what does the virus, which is making so many people frightened, actually look like? Um, it's got lots of, like, bumpy things on it, and it looks cheeky and not very nice. <laughs> yes, it looks very cheeky. Thomas Spletschdusser, a scientific illustrator and animator, thinks the drawings are pretty good, though he finds many depictions of viruses problematic. This for a children's book is actually quite nice. It's a very simplified depiction, which is totally okay, but it shows the main features and so on. But what I sometimes get a little bit upset about is illustrations that are used for online articles, for example, um, like this one, because they use depictions that do not resemble the virus at all. And they are often taken from stock image sites. Like this one, as you see, all of these are supposed to be coronavirus, and each and every depiction is completely different from one another, and none of them resemble the actual virus. Spletschdusser knows exactly what the virus looks like. Researchers email their raw data to him. That includes information about almost every atom in the protein, like the size and number of spikes on the surface. He loads the data into a molecular viewer and then exports it into his state-of-the-art 3D software, which is also used by Hollywood for special effects. Scientists use his illustrations for their publications in popular and scientific magazines. These graphic illustrations for the scientific community are a valuable resource in the fight against the coronavirus epidemic. The scientific data that they try to show can often be very confusing and hard to grasp. For example, here we have the structure of the protease um, in a molecular viewer. And as we see, it's really hard to see what is going on here. The white thing in the middle is the inhibitor that can potentially disable the whole protein. So therefore, it's a good drug target. But um, it's kind of hard to see. So what I do is I illustrate the same data in a very clear way that makes it easy to understand what exactly is going on here in this binding pocket, for example. This gives other virologists a precise idea of what their colleagues are working on. Spletschdusser is a doctor of biology. During his studies, he was often irritated by how many graphic illustrators had no clue what they were depicting. He decided to fill this gap, and so he became a scientific graphic illustrator. He loves his job largely because of the artistic freedom that exists, despite the rigors of science. Here we have my illustration of the coronavirus and here we have the illustration of another scientific illustrator. And as you see, we chose very different colors and slightly different style of how to depict them, even though the overall structure of the virus are very similar. Regardless of the color, Ben and Fionn aren't afraid of the virus. If they're able to see the invisible virus, they know how they'd react. I would tell him to go away. i say, shoo, shoo, push off. <laughs> the two youngsters understand there needs to be a vaccine against coronavirus before they can start playing here again with all their friends. And 
before they can finally give their grandparents in England a hug. And for more, I'm joined by Professor Ralph Hatwick, director of the Center for Adaptive Rationality at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. Good to have you with us. Uh, please, first of all, you and your colleagues, uh, you're looking into cognitive tools and strategies that lead to us being able to, to make a decision, hopefully a good one. How important is it for us to visualize something in order to be able to act or react? Good question. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, if we talk about the risks, uh, and a lot of our decisions are related to the risks that we perceive in the world, uh, one general finding in, in research on risk perception is that things that we can see are actually often perceived to be more risky. I mean, just think, for instance, of walking in a dark forest and you hear a rustling. Uh, and, uh, of course, it makes you afraid, and that feels very different than walking through the same forest during the day and suddenly seeing, oh, it's just a rabbit. So things that we do not see tend to make us more anxious. Okay, but that is very interesting because obviously we've lived with this invisible virus, this new coronavirus now for for at least eight months. And uh, it seems to be that this fear is wearing off with some people. They don't necessarily keep uh, distance anymore. They don't wear masks anymore. Why is that? Well, I mean, in, in all likelihood, there are many different uh, motives that come together. Uh, um, and you can think, for instance, of convenience. I mean, uh, some of these measures are really uh, quite inconvenient, in particular during hot weather. But that's certainly not the only reason. Uh, there's probably also something in play that is called uh, the prevention paradox, meaning that uh, if the preventions were successful, uh, and the catastrophe, if you will, or the disaster doesn't happen, then one question is, well, maybe uh, the risk wasn't that big to begin with. Uh, that is one possible reaction. And the other one is, of course, to say, well, actually, the prevention was successful. And I think some of this is now happening, that some people seem to uh, have the impression that the risk is possibly not as big as uh, it was often said in the media and by politicians. But, of course, we all know that the virus is still very much alive and kicking. So what is necessary uh, to revive the kind of fear or respect that people had at the beginning of the pandemic? Well, that's an important question. And uh, if I could e easily answer it, I would uh, be much richer than I'm actually. Uh, that's a $1 million question. Uh, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we keep talking about this as a crisis. And even the framing of a crisis typically means that a crisis passes. Um, I mean, a crisis is typically not years long. And I think what's important is that we meet, need to possibly change our mental model of the problem, namely that we need to adjust our expectations that this is a problem that is not going to disappear within days, weeks, or months, that it possibly stays with us for quite a long time. I mean, can we sort of learn something perhaps also from uh, religion? I mean, every religion in the world is based on people believing in something they cannot see, they cannot touch, yet they believe in it, they even follow rules, while others don't. What is it that makes the difference in, in people following religion and something they can't see and others don't? I have no idea. Uh, but I, I wouldn't... <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't bet here on religion. I think that uh, what what we uh, what is helpful is to understand the to understand the data that we have and uh, and also uh, to try to employ evidence based uh, means. In, in other words, uh, there's now lots of evidence that shows that wearing masks and keeping distance is really an effective way of dealing uh, with the coronavirus. And so I would, uh, for me, I would not wage on a religion here, but really uh, on uh, the best evidence that is currently available. All right, Professor Ralf Hatwig, uh, Director of the Center for Adaptive Rationality at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. Uh, thank you so much for your time. You're more than welcome. Well, time for your questions now. Over to our science correspondent, and that's Derek Williams. Does SARS-CoV-2 incorporate genetic material into your DNA that remains even when the disease is passed? 
a number of, of different viruses, among them, for example, HIV or, or herpes viruses, use a variety of, of different methods to incorporate their own genetic material into that of the cells that they invade. In fact, a substantial portion of, of human DNA, uh, we think around 8%, isn't, strictly speaking, human in origin. Um, it's genetic information from viruses that integrated into the human genome at some point in the far distant past and has been hanging around in our genetic code ever since, which is, is kind of freaky when you think about it. I mean, it's thought that these sequences might be involved actually in a wide range of what we consider to be non-infectious diseases like, like cancer or, or dementia. But SARS-CoV-2 isn't the kind of virus that replicates by integrating into our genome. Um, it doesn't have to invade the cell nucleus where our DNA is. It can find everything that it needs to make more of itself in what's, what's called the cytoplasm, which is the, the gel-like substance that's inside the cell membrane but outside the cell nucleus. And before we go, a coronavirus vaccine developed in Russia has been registered for use. Russian President Vladimir Putin says the vaccine offers lasting immunity and that medical workers, teachers and other risk groups will be the first to be inoculated. But many scientists are skeptical. The vaccine did not undergo phase three trials, which normally last for months and involve thousands of people.